Hi, I'm Ali Patterson, and welcome to another episode of The Fintech Show. In recent years, advancements in digital technology have allowed for a much faster and easier customer experience in comparison to past banking methods. But do these new technologies open up a gateway that makes it easier for criminals to commit fraud? Coming up, we sit down with BAE Systems, Starling Bank, and NatWest to take a look at how developments in technology have impacted the chances of becoming a target of fraudulent activity. First up, I talk with BAE's Gareth Evans as we explore the importance of data in regards to fraud and how something as basic as social media activity is proving to be a valuable asset for online fraudsters. You can't do cyber fraud without data. Um, ultimately, the whole cyber part of cyber fraud is largely about taking hold of your data. And they take hold of your data in order to um, trick the bank into um, releasing your money, trick you into releasing your money, or um, just to access your, your funds and move it elsewhere. You can't do anything without data. So data is, is critical. And the reality is there's more data now than there's ever been before. Um, we have to have the understanding of how important that data is um, in keeping yourself safe. Um, and it's usually not the data that you think that's um, the problem, but it's things like your email addresses, your telephones, um, largely because almost everything that you have on the internet has the telephone or the internet as a fallback for resetting your password, for um, confirming your details, for helping you when things go wrong. So um, people getting access to say your email account or your, um, your telephone data so you can redirect your phone can do a huge amount of harm to your entire online footprint. And everybody's online footprint is, is kind of growing exponentially every year. So absolutely for cyber fraud, data is key. Data security is key and understanding what to do with that data is key. The huge increase in the amount of data that's available has made it a target. The fact that it's now available through many different means due to new technologies means that it has become a really valuable asset and it is used to facilitate fraud. Again, we have to um, make sure that we're vigilant at all times across all of our platforms, across all our technologies. Um, it creates great opportunity, but it does mean that we have to be aware of all of the risks and the threats to all of the data across the board. I think we are having to fight not only traditional fraud, but cyber fraud because one's being used for the other. So as we have an increase in um, the amount of data that we've got and we use, we're having to make sure we protect that because it's being used to commit traditional fraud in the ways that we've seen it before. So we're getting a sort of a double whammy. What we are seeing is the attack vector is widening. So in the past, people used to target your bank account because you know that was the obvious place to go after your money. But now we're seeing um, a lot more being targeted. So not just things like um, social media in terms of um, trying to get hold of access of your data and, and kind of looking at your, your online footprint, using things like Twitter to see when people are complaining and then contacting them directly through Twitter and saying, hi, I'm calling from ABC Bank. I understand you've got a problem. Um, I'm here to help you. Can you give me your password? And I'll have a look at your account. So they're using these kind of third parties. I think with open banking coming along and more third parties connecting to the banks, I think they become more vulnerable. So instead of targeting the customer and say, hey, I'm calling from, from the bank, do you know X, Y is happening? I'm now saying, hey, I'm calling from Uber or I'm calling from Airbnb or I'm calling from, from somewhere else. So it's kind of widening that threat. So I think customers are quite conditioned to not giving their bank account details out or giving their confidential information out when it's the bank until they're verified. But I think they're less ready to think like that when it's somebody that's not their bank collect, um, calling them. In the same way with, um, with some of the social engineering, we've seen things like solicitors being targeted and the invoicing sort of procurement type um, departments of, of organizations being targeted in order to commit the fraud down the line and not just going after the bank. So I think that will continue. I think um, you know, the bigger the digital footprint that we have, the bigger the banks open up, the more we do online, the wider that attack vector is going to get and the more opportunities. I mean, email is the classic. If I can get hold of your, um, your, your Gmail password, I can pretty much guarantee I can reset almost everything that you've ever signed up for. Today, we have masses of data to sift through, to analyze, and that allows us to work in a way which is preventative of these sorts of attacks rather than solely reactive. We can learn from industry-wide trends, and we can therefore put measures in place very early on before they've even happened at our door to make sure that we're prepared for these sorts of attacks when they arrive. Next up, we take a look at how technology has affected cyber-enabled fraud 
and how digital advancements such as AI can help financial technology companies to protect their customers. Cyber-enabled fraud has lowered the barrier to committing fraud and also increased the um, attack vector. So in the days of, of say, check fraud or um, some kind of confidence trickster where you kind of knock on, on somebody's door and, and pretend to be from the gas, um, you can only target one person at a time and it's quite labor intensive. But with the advent of technology to send um, a million emails or a hundred million emails or, or 10 emails, it's the same effort, largely. So um, the ability to um, attack more um, people at the same time is, is the key for, um, for cyber-enabled fraud and technology. On the other hand, um, it also allows us to use things like machine learning, artificial intelligence to better predict um, people's uh, behaviours and therefore identify when um, the fraudster is um, take, doing behaviour that is not typical for that individual. And therefore, it helps in the battle to prevent fraud. We also are much better at things like understanding the device, the way that you move around the screen, the, um, the way that you key in your, your details. We can get a much better picture of, of URU um, than ever before. So I think it's changed the game, um, but the game is still ultimately the same. It's still bad people trying to steal money from good people and um, the banks trying to stop them. So we're able to take um, a lot of data, such as metadata about our data and how it's used and use that and feed that into um, AI and machine learning algorithms to detect anomalies. So that's a great advantage and the cloud gives us the power to do that at scale. So we're able to monitor a lot more than we would have been able to on traditional systems because we've got the ability to plug it into all sorts of different systems, um, analyze that data, work out what's being used where, when something's not right, we're able to go and look at it in more detail and, and actually drill down on that and find out what's going on. AI has so many uses across banking, some positive, some maybe not so positive. I think from a fraud defense perspective, we use um, AI to uh, help improve um, models. So traditionally, we used to look at detecting fraud through um, kind of a series of, of questions, if you like. Um, but with AI, we can become a lot more granular with that. Meanwhile, the other side of the equation, um, banks are able to um, tailor journeys and user journeys directly to customers using AI and better understanding of their behaviors and profiles can allow the bank to better communicate, give a better experience, but also make it a more secure experience because um, it becomes more individual. And the more individual the journey, the harder it is for a, a social engineering, for instance, to try and, and fix that um, and sort of con that, that journey by, um, by sort of um, understanding exactly how you're doing. So, you know, simple things like um, the AI um, being able to understand how to communicate, how your communication preferences are and how you start those communication preferences um, in some ways can give me confidence that it is the bank that's speaking to me and not um, a third party. I, I think it's probably being used already across organizations and I guess because security and, and fraud and, and uh, control is such a, a key part of banking, it's there all of the time. All the banks across financial services are looking at how they can improve that all of the time to keep our our customers safe and secure. It's something we do as a bank all of the time is try and improve our security and controls and our understanding in, uh, of our customers' data. So um, it may be invisible to, to our customers, but it probably is being used in other banks at the moment. And again, it's something that we will continue to explore and see how we can continue to modernize, enhance and improve our technology and our security to help our customers. How can AI and other technology tools help improve the customer experience and walk that, uh, walk that fine line between customer experience and identifying and preventing fraud? Um, that is the, uh, the million dollar question. Um, and it's something that everybody is, is striving for. And it's, there isn't really a kind of a hard and fast answer. I think for me, it's, it's using technologies like uh, AI and, and machine learning. It's um, looking at risk. Um, understanding where your risk sits and at what point your, your tolerance to risk forces you to, um, to give a, a somewhat negative impact on the customer versus when do you accept an element of risk on the basis that uh, overall you are giving a better view of the customer. Now the interesting thing is that for most customers actually a transaction being stopped because of fraud when it is risky is a pretty good experience because it does tell the, um, the, tell the customer that the bank is actually kind of looking after them and is aware of what's going on. I think um, most people will take that um, sort of once or twice. The challenge becomes as if um, it happens too often and then it interrupts your, your sort of general customer experience. You can go from a negative. So finding that balance and that fine line is something that we're all striving for and you know, with different successes. So beyond technological advancements and artificial intelligence, 
what else can financial providers actually do to protect their customers and their data from fraudulent activity? So education is the first one, um, although I would question how far education can help and where you can realistically expect to put the onus on the customer to, to sort of keep themselves um, secure. We all know that we should be secure online. I know it should be insecure online, but I also know I do a lot of practices that I, I would cringe at in reality because um, there is such um, an array of, of online profiles. I, I go on the internet all the time. I open up things. I buy um, goods from from organizations without checking to see who they are. I use the same password on a number of different sites. I use my same email for a lot of different things. So I know I, I, I put my own bad behavior in there. So I think education alone isn't there, but I think you do need to have sort of a level of education and, and kind of inform people of scams and things that are out there. I think collaboration is a big one. Um, I think the ability for um, banks, law enforcement, um, agencies, things like, um, like you know, sort of uh, financial uh, services uh, agencies and things. Vendors like ourselves at BAE um, can all sort of be better at working together to collectively combat um, combat the fraud. So, for example, within BAE, we've got something called the Intelligence Network, which is a kind of a social experiment almost where we are um, trying to create thought leadership pieces in conjunction with, um, with banks, with um, financial services authorities to tackle um, subjects like cyber fraud um, and other similar subjects and say, well, rather than putting the onus on, on the banks independently or on the vendors to come up with a technological solution, how do we collectively as an industry work towards solving a problem? How do we tackle this? So we might sort of um, run workshops and um, put together sort of thought leadership pieces, videos and so on, and try and kind of um, tackle these collectively. And I think that in many ways, um, the industry getting together to solve problems is probably more of a strong solution than just saying, well, we just need to educate the customers and put a, uh, a help page on the website. Does an institution of your size look to collaborate with other technological partners to potentially provide the most up-to-date AI service that you can? Yeah, I think it, make, it makes perfect sense for us as an organization to continue to look at what's happening in the marketplace, what's happening in, in, in technology. Uh, as a bank, we have innovation assets um, in Silicon Valley, in, in Tel Aviv, across the UK and Ireland, who are all looking at how we can, uh, what, what's happening in fintech, what's happening in technology, and how can we bring that best of technology back into the bank to help us improve every aspect of the bank. And that goes the same for AI. If there's any new f um, technology companies with something interesting, we'll, we'll be speaking to them and see how we can harness that and even uh, in engage with them to explore, collaborate, and test some of these things to see if they're, if they're of value to us as an organization and for our customers. We definitely see that there are socially engineered fraud trends occurring every month. In, in the wider industry, but we are able with the streams of data that we have to look for those trends, look for those anomalies and actually act again in a preventative manner rather than a reactive manner. We're also extremely fortunate that data sharing and insight sharing is something which is, is, is very supported in the wider finance industry and by that I mean that if we as Starling Bank see trends, fraud trends in the industry that we feel that we should share with other banks, that's something which we do and other banks do that with us. And that is something which is extremely important when fighting trend-based fraud. So it seems that the growth of digital technology definitely correlates with the risk of fraud. But with tools such as artificial intelligence coming into play, it looks like the future in terms of customer security may not all be that bad. That's it from us. Thanks for watching and be sure to join us for the next episode of The Fintech Show.